Every time you study a lava, it will behave somewhat different than what you might expect, which is why we're trying to build a, a catalog of the flow properties of, of different types of lavas. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Natural disasters cause thousands of deaths and results in billions of dollars in damages to infrastructure every year. NSF supports the basic research in science and engineering needed to understand natural hazards. One such researcher is our guest today, Stefan Kolzenberg, assistant professor of geology, whose laboratory for experimental volcanology and petrology at the University at Buffalo is working for a better understanding of volcanic rheology. Dr. Kolzenberg, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I, I want to start with your early interests. How did you get interested in volcanoes? Um, it kind of started with uh, traveling, I suppose. I've always been uh, a fond traveler. And um, then through traveling, I got interested in geology and um, yeah, seeing all the rocks that I was able to, to hike through on trips across the globe. And then ultimately, within geology, volcanoes just became very interesting because they're some of the most dynamic geological processes that there are. So one of the things when I was doing research was finding about the time scales that are involved that can make these still be considered active. Because I think we generally think of active as like exploding right now or erupting right now. What is the definition, I guess, for what makes a volcano active? Um, yeah, it's an interesting part. In, in geology, we consider anything that erupted within the sort of last 10,000 years an active volcano. <laughs> but um, human time scales are much, much shorter than that. And um, it tends to be difficult for people to grasp what an active volcanic system is. Um, I think the the Lake Grand Fields in Italy um, are a great example where you know they they've been quite active even in in historic times, but there wasn't ever a, a very large eruption um, that could in this case destroy Naples. Thinking about the the volcanic systems themselves, can they form anywhere? Like how does like what's the difference between a volcano and a mountain or any other kind of natural formation we might see? Yeah. Um, I guess it kind of goes back to the the time scale questions. Um, I think it's sort of a, a two part question here. So I'll go. I'll start with: Can they form anywhere? Um, ultimately, they need active tectonic settings to to happen. Right, the crust needs to have cracks in it in order for magma to ascend through it and then ultimately erupt, forming a volcano. Um, so on our planet, the continental plate. Uh, or the tectonic plates you move around and um, that requires a sort of malleable soft mantle underneath and as the tectonic plates glide um, they rip apart in some places and that is where volcanism is occurring that's one one location and Iceland is a great example of that it sits atop of the mid-Atlantic ridge it's being pulled apart and so there the mantle is exposed and magma can make its way up to the surface um, then if our planet, if the crust were to just continue to grow, then our planet would have to get bigger, right? And that, that's not an opportunity. So <laughs> the crust has to be consumed in other parts, and that happens at subduction zones, sort of the, the ring of fire is what people might know. Um, and this is where some of the crust gets shoved back into the mantle. And as that happens, you bring volatiles, largely uh, water, back into uh, magmatic systems, and that can charge them with volatile material to bring them back up to the crust. Um, so coming back to your question of uh, whether every mountain can potentially be a volcano, um, the answer to that would be no, not every mountain can be a volcano. And interestingly also, not every volcano has to be a mountain. You know, if you ask a kid to draw a volcano, you'll get a triangle with a bit of fire at the top. Right. Um, and that is because there is material being brought through the crust and then deposit it onto the surface. But if you scale up the magnitude of these magmatic events to, um, say, places like Yellowstone or the, the Fugain fields in Italy that I mentioned before, there the magma chambers become so large that um, when they erupt, they actually form depressions. They distribute material extremely widely across um, Earth's surface and then form what we call calderas. So you can have depression features that are uh, volcanic systems as well. That's interesting. 
So you had mentioned Iceland, and that's going to come up a lot in our conversation today. They had an eruption earlier this year. So I got to thinking about why are eruptions difficult to forecast? Like, why is it hard to know when they're going to happen? Yeah, um, I think it brings us back to the concept of of time scales. <laughs> so accumulation of what we call eruptible magma, magma that is sufficiently liquid and there's enough volume that it can create enough buoyant force to want to rise through the crust. Um, that accumulation process is very, very slow. And we're actually, there's a lot we don't understand yet about how um, you transform from sort of this a solid but malleable mantle to something that um, yeah generates magmas that are able to move and have sufficient volume to generate eruptions. Um, but once it moves, it can become quite fast. Um, and so what makes the, the magma want to come from depth to the surface is an overpressure. And that is, um, again, the the fact that this hot molten material has a lower density than the average sort of crust. And so then you have a low density material that's trapped deep in the earth and it wants to stratify itself. It's you come to a, a more um, stable layering in terms of the density, right? So it wants to pop out to the surface. And in a lot of these magmas, we have volatile materials, largely water and CO2 that are trapped in there. And as the magma ascends through the crust, the pressure that it experiences decreases, and that forms little gas bubbles. And so these gas bubbles further increase that buoyancy difference, uh, sorry, the density difference, creating more buoyant force to shove it to the surface if you want. And I think a, a good analogy for anyone who's been scuba diving is if you imagine <laughs> yourself in, at like 20 meters depth in the water, and all of a sudden you inflate this light vest around you, then you're going right up, right? <laughs> and this is the same thing that happens to magmas. You form these bubbles, you create a lower density material, and that just wants to go out. So you mentioned the fields in Italy and Yellowstone there, and I wanted to get at some of the other hazards that people might not generally think of beyond the smoke side effect and lava fields themselves. Like, what are the other things that happen around volcanoes um yeah so as a as a volcanologist or as volcanologists in general we like to look at liquid rock um but it turns out while that builds volcanoes that is um by far not the most hazardous process um around the volcano and really the most um hazards that are posed by volcanoes especially these constructive features that we had talked about before are mass movements so if you if you think about volcanic processes, you generate lots of um, an explosive eruptions, particulate material. You pile them up in these really steep cones, and so that's ultimately like playing in a sandbox. If you pile loose <laughs> fractured or granular material um, at the angle of repose, so the steepest angle it can possibly uh, hold under gravity, and then the moment it rains on it, that stuff wants to move, right? So you you generate these things called lahars. Um, and yeah, mass movements are really by far the most dangerous processes on volcanoes. Are there good eruptions? Is there anything positive for the environment that comes out of this? Um, it's a, another uh, time scale question, I guess. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say there are eruptions that have an immediate positive impact on the environment on the time scales that, that humans like to live on or have to live on. <laughs> Really, most materials that come out of volcanoes are inherently unstable when they become uh, in contact with the atmosphere. So they are exposed to the elements then, um, largely water that starts to break down all the minerals that have uh, been formed. And that can, over long time scales, transition into rather fertile soils. Very interesting. So, so the last kind of basics thing I wanted to ask you about is I think some people don't have a clear definition in their head of what the difference between magma and lava is. Yeah, um, it's a rather <laughs> simple difference. Magma is when liquid rock is in the earth, and we call it lava the moment it comes out of the earth. So moving on here, 
let's get into the fun stuff you get to work on. You get to study actively erupting volcanoes. Like earlier this year, the Lickley Cruder uh, eruption, you were part of a team that went out there and studied the lava. So how do you study an actively erupting volcano? Yeah, so that, that really depends on what kind of volcano you, um, you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at effusive eruptions like this last one in Iceland, then um, the, these are relatively well-behaved, if you want. Um, it's the, they're moderately hazardous. Um, they're, it's unlikely that you would encounter large explosions and sort of flying rock that can hit you. And that allows you to get up close and, and touch it and, well, touch it with equipment <laughs> um, and observe it in great detail. Whereas explosive volcanoes, are much, much more hazardous when they're active. And so these are nearly impossible to study up close, and we need to rely on remote sensing equipment. Whereas again, um, for effusive eruptions, so lava flows, you do get to go there and you do get to poke it. Um, and in the case like this last eruption in Iceland, it was incredibly well located um, right between the airport and the capital. So that access um, is or was quite um, easy in this case. Yeah, first step, you have to be near roads. <laughs> um, so you you talked about being able to interact with it or touch it with tools. What kind of tools do you use when you're in that close proximity? Um, so the the typical tools that you use are made of stainless steel, and then um, it really depends on what you're trying to get. More often than not, people are interested in the composition and the texture of the lava. And then we simply build very long scoopers. Um, and because we want to preserve the uh, texture and the composition right at the point when it samples, um, we then dump it into a bucket of water typically to quench it and make it cool very fast so that the, the types of crystals and the uh, crystal content is, is preserved. Um, so yeah, if you want to get up close and measure the flow properties of lavas, um, then you really need to build your own equipment. And we've developed together with uh, colleagues at the University of Clermont for all two different types of uh, what we call field rheometers. One is a tool that you stick into the lava and then it starts spinning around and you measure the force required in order to maintain a constant rotation speed. And when they become more viscous, then the rotational tool ends up uh, reaching its limits. And we've built a, a partner device that is called a penetrometer. And this is ultimately a, a half a sphere that you push into the lava and we measure the rate of penetration and the force required for penetration. Um, so our group was funded for the fieldwork in Iceland, but something that we were able to do the, the year before, sort of with what we have available locally here at UB, was test a lot of these um, field equipment in what we call the Geohazards Field Station here at UB. It's also an NSF-funded um, yeah, facility that enables us to generate up to 30 liters of melt. And so we have a, a large induction furnace where we can make vats of, of lava and play with it. And um, that was fundamental in the training of the, the PhD students that were able to go out to the field and, yeah, basically training them how to approach active lavas, how to work with liquid rock when it's at the end of the stick that you're trying to poke into it. Um, and so really having this NSF-funded uh, geohazards field station on the ground combined with the laboratory that I have here helped us build this new equipment and get it almost all the way to field deployment to then really make sure we have something that we're confident in and go out there and test. As you were answering that question, it occurred to me to ask, you, as you were mentioning the crystals that are forming, I'm wondering if, there, if there's a mineral difference at different volcanoes. Like, is the kind of stuff that's coming to the surface the same in different areas or is it dep really depend on the region? Um, so it's, it's very dependent on the region because the magma generation processes are unique from site to site. So you mentioned 
studying the lava potentially by reheating it back at home. So can you tell me about how you're studying that in your lab? Yeah, so in my laboratory, I have uh, what we call rheometers again. Um, so these are machines that can um, stir or oscillate materials and then measure, again, the, the response, the deformation response to a certain imposed stress. So we, we push them or we spin them or we stir them and then um, measure how much force does it take right, to do to deform at a certain rate. And that's how we measure the, the viscosity. And I have mounted these on top of um, high temperature furnaces. So I can take material from the field and I can remelt it at temperatures sort of between about 1,000 to maybe 1,600 centigrade. Um, so it's really, really hot. <laughs> and um, then I have added a gas mixing system so that I can control um, the activity of oxygen in that environment. And that allows me to then, yeah, try to recreate as best as possible the environment in which these melts find themselves uh, in their hole while doing it in my hole, well, in, in my laboratory. And so what we hope to do now is combine our understanding from the laboratory with real measurements at actively flowing lava to understand um, how well does the stuff we do in the lab really represent what's going on in nature. And that ultimately will hopefully help us um, predict better how fast and how far lava might flow. Special thanks to Stefan Kolzenberg. For The Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.